Tonight I want us to take a look at the book of Hosea and think together about the minor prophets. The prophets were inspired spokesmen for God. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, we find that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1 verses 20 and 21. The prophets, they were foretellers in that they foretold future events, but their primary mission was to preach God's word. They preached God's word to the people of God, and they preached to other nations also, and warned God's people and warned other nations about sin and rebellion against God. Frequently, prophets would warn of judgment to come. They would warn of captivity if God's people did not remain faithful. We've been studying on Sunday mornings. Uh, some time ago, we studied the book of Deuteronomy, and this past Sunday, we revisited uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 and noted that God required his people to be faithful to him if they would remain in the land of Canaan. The problem was they frequently turned away from God and they served false gods and consequently they were taken into captivity. Hosea is the first of the minor prophets in the closing part of the Old Testament, we have 12 books. These 12 books are known as the Minor Prophets. They're probably books that we study less than any other section of the Bible. We probably know less about the Minor Prophets than we do any other section of the Bible. But there are great spiritual treasures in the Minor Prophets. And tonight, I'd like for us to think together and study uh, the book of Hosea. What I'd like to do, and I think this would go along very well with our study on Sunday morning of the scheme of redemption, I'd like for us to have one study of each of the minor prophets for one class period. In other words, tonight I want to cover the entire book of Hosea. I believe I can do it in the time we have. Obviously, we're going to have to hit the high points. And so I, what I want to do is summarize the book of Hosea and close with some lessons that apply to our lives. And I believe that this will get us interested in this section of the Old, Test, Old Testament. And perhaps we will study this section more on our own and learn more about these great men of faith who serve God as prophets in the Old Testament. Why should we study the Old Testament prophets? We should study the Old Testament prophets to have a more complete knowledge of God's Word. We should study the Old Testament prophets to enrich our lives as we apply their teaching to our lives. Uh, we're going to see tonight that the message of Hosea is very relevant it is up to date with our times. And so uh, we need to study the prophets that we might apply their teaching to our lives. We should study the prophets that we might equip ourselves to meet the moral, social, and spiritual problems of our day. When we see how the prophets dealt with issues, we can take those same principles and we can use those principles to deal with challenges and problems we encounter today. And then we should study the prophets that we might be inspired by their example. Uh, I remember James wrote, as we're studying on uh, Sunday morning, I'm, I'm preaching some sermons from the book of James, take my brethren the prophets for an example. Consider the prophets. And so that's what I would like for us to do, consider the prophets. Now, with that information in mind, I want to give you some basic information about Hosea. Hosea was the son of Beri. We learn this from the first verse of the book. Who was Beri? I don't know. We don't know much at all about him. We know very little about Hosea apart from what we have in the book of Hosea.
And we do have uh, a good deal of information. There are other things we'd like to know about his life, but God has given us what we need to know that we might understand his mission and his message and how all of this can help us in our day. Hosea prophesied in the 8th century B.C. from about 750 B.C. to 725 B.C. He prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel. You are familiar with other prophets who were contemporaries of Hosea. Hosea prophesied alongside Amos. Amos and Hosea were both prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel. And while they were prophesying to the northern kingdom, Micah and Isaiah were prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah. And so all of these men working simultaneously, side by side, uh, working for the Lord, speaking for God, preaching God's word to God's people, both the northern and southern kingdoms. Verse 1 of Hosea reveals that Hosea prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam. Let's read verse 1 together. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, Joash king of Israel. So he prophesied in the days of Jeroboam, this would be Jeroboam the second. This was a time of great prosperity for the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, they were doing quite well in a number of ways. The problem was they had forgotten God and they had wandered away from God. They served Baal served false gods. They were guilty of all types of immorality and wickedness. And, and we'll consider more along that line in just a moment. Hosea's mission was to denounce Israel for their sins, to preach and to warn that they would suffer captivity if they did not repent. And to get ahead of ourselves here in the book of 2 Kings chapter 17, you can read what the end result was. The sad, uh, sad fact is the people did not repent and ultimately they were taken into uh, Assyrian captivity, the record of which is 2 Kings chapter 17. But it wasn't Hosea's fault. He warned the people. He did what God would have him to do. He pled with them to turn from their sins, and they were guilty of many sins. Take a look at chapter 4. This is one of the key passages of the book. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Hosea was inspired of God, and so he says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing, and lying, and killing, and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beast of the field, and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Taken away Yes, taken away into captivity. The northern kingdom of Israel is going to fall. If you people do not repent of your swearing and lying and killing and stealing and murdering. Did you notice there in the latter part of verse 2, they commit adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. So the idea is... A murder was so prevalent, you have one crime scene here and the blood of that crime scene trickles over into the blood of the next crime scene. Blood touches blood. All of this uh, murder, committing adultery, serving Baal, not mentioned here, but we'll see it's mentioned elsewhere in the book. And they were guilty of spiritual adultery. 
Just file that term away in your mind because we're going to come back to it. God's people were guilty of adultery. They were guilty of actual and physical adultery, but they were also guilty of spiritual adultery. What is spiritual adultery? Well, the prophets, Hosea in particular, used the term whoredom or harlotry to refer to spiritual adultery, being unfaithful to God. God wanted to be married to his people Israel. And they had a relationship. And yet, the people of Israel, they would not remain faithful to God. They broke the covenant. They turned away from God. Even though God loved his people unconditionally and was willing to take them back after they had forsaken him, after they had abandoned the a covenant that they had with him, and yet they would not uh, love God in return. They would not repent and do God's will. Hosea is called the prophet of divine love, the prophet of divine love. And when you read this book, you'll find why he's referred to as the prophet of divine love because he depicts God's great love for his people just as Hosea took a wife and he loved her her name was Gomer and Gomer was unfaithful to Hosea she became an adulteress and she left her husband Hosea but he loved her and he took her back and he forgave her and their relationship was restored. And that relationship between Hosea and Gomer illustrates the relationship that God wanted there to be between himself and his people. But whereas Hosea and Gomer, their relationship was mended and restored, that was not the case with God and the people of Israel. Though God was willing to take them back, they did not take God back. They did not repent, and they persisted in sin, and they were taken away into captivity. Well, that's the, the context in which we find Hosea prophesying in the 8th century B.C. His message, return. Return is probably the key word of the book. It's used 15 times in the book of Hosea. Return. And why is that the key term? Return to God. Turn from your sins. God loves you. Don't abandon God. God has done so much for you. And so return to God. For example, in chapter 6 and verse 1, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. Oh, we've suffered. We've suffered the judgment of God but he will still take us back. He will mend our wounds and we can be restored to God, our first love. Because Hosea uh, highlights love in this book, he's sometimes compared to John, the apostle of love in the New Testament. John, of course, wrote much about the subject of love, first and second John, third John as well and even uh, the gospel according to John, John's account of the gospel. He wrote a lot about love, and Hosea is compared to John for that reason. Hosea would marry a woman, Gomer, who was unfaithful to him. He took, who took her back, and their marriage was restored. Israel had become unfaithful to God, and yet they would not return. They would not repent. Take a look at chapter 2, and this is where we find the spiritual adultery. In chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible says, For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall find not her paths. 
And so she's going to go after her lovers. Verse 7, And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. She would go after her lovers, but it seems God would try to dissuade her, try to discourage her from, from that. In verse 13 of chapter 2, And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them. And she decked herself with earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgot me, saith the Lord. So Israel had other lovers. That is, God's people relied on other nations, depended on them rather than depending on God. Uh, when they were concerned that they might be attacked, rather than trusting in God, they looked to other nations. They put their trust in other nations for riches and wealth, and they took great pride in the association they had with their lovers. And that's why God referred to them as uh, being guilty of har harlotry and whoredom. In chapter 4, verse 12, My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. So they ask counsel at their stocks. A stock is a, a wooden pole uh, that was used in worshiping Baal. So they worship at their stocks and they were guilty of all kinds of wickedness mentioned there in verse 14 of chapter 4. Take a look at chapter 4 verse 14. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom nor your spouses when they commit adultery for themselves are separated with whores and they sacrifice with harlots Therefore, the people that doth not understand shall fall. Notice in that passage it says they sacrifice with harlots. And so as they served their pagan gods, they not only were guilty of spiritual adultery, but they actually committed physical adultery in worshiping their false gods. So they offered their sacrifices with harlots and they worshiped their gods by this sexual perversion that's described here. And so they had wandered far, far from God. The book of Hosea is divided into two sections. Chapters 1 through 3 is that section dealing with Hosea's uh, actual relationship that he had with his wife, which serves as an illustration of God's relationship with Israel. The second half of the book is, uh, second part of the book is verse, chapters 4 through 14. And this is the section having to do with the application that was made to Israel. Uh, God using the relationship between Hosea and Gomer to apply to his people Israel. Now with these thoughts in mind, I want us to go back to chapter 1 and in chapter 1 we have in my estimation a summary of the entire book. If we get chapter 1 then we understand the book of Hosea. So let's consider some things about Hosea's relationship with his wife, her unfaithfulness to him and then I'll uh, share with you some lessons we learned from this book. Let's read now verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, which conceived and bare him a son. 
go and take a wife of whoredoms. That might sound a bit strange, and inevitably, when teaching this, discussing this, the question comes up, uh, did God actually instruct his prophet to go and marry a whore? Did he go and, and marry a woman actively involved in prostitution? prostitution? Well, some say yes, and yet others say that it's likely that she was not at this time uh, a harlot, but she became that. She turned from Hosea and she became unfaithful to him. You know, if you make the comparison to God and his people Israel, they were for a while faithful to God, weren't they? And then they turned away from God. So if that is parallel to the relationship between Hosea and Gomer, then we might think that Gomer was originally faithful to Hosea, but she became unfaithful and she became a harlot. Um, so that's one thought that you might consider. They had children together. Uh, let me back up and say this. They had a child together. And you'll understand why I uh, specified a child rather than children in just a moment. And we read there in the closing part of verse 3 about the first son. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, which conceived and bare him a son. The names of the children we're about to read are significant as this relates to the book of Hosea. The first son, his name is Jezreel. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. The name Jezreel means God scatters. God scatters. And that's why we find in the closing part of verse 4, God saying, Name him Jezreel, because I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. The people of Israel are going to be scattered. So, Hosea, I want you to name your son Jezreel because that name has significance as it relates to your mission. You go and warn God's people, the people of Israel, because they are soon to be scattered if they do not repent of their sin. And then in verse 5, And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And then in verse 6, And she conceived again and bare a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name Laruma, Laruhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Many believe that these latter uh, children, the daughter mentioned in verse 6, and the other son we're about to read about, uh, were conceived not by Gomer and Hosea together, but that this was a child born after she became unfaithful. She conceived again, verse 6, bear a daughter, Laruhama, and notice the name and the significance, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. That name, which is hard to pronounce, means no mercy, not to be pitied. Well, what is the significance of that? Because God's, God's mercy is wearing very thin with his people. So you name this daughter a name that signifies no mercy because you're about to go into captivity. And then we read about a son there in verses 8 and 9. Now when she had weaned Laruma, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. That name, Loami, means not my people. Well, who were not God's people? Well, the people of Israel, they would no longer be God's people if they continued 
in their rebellion to God. So the names of the children are significant. Jezreel, God scatters, Laruhama, no mercy, not to be pitied, Loami, not my people. So God is saying through the names of these children, I'm going to scatter my people. They're going to be taken into Assyrian captivity. I won't have mercy. My mercy is wearing thin and my patience will one day wear out. And you will no longer be my people and I will not be your God. I'm going to allow you to have your false gods. But the good news is there, there was hope. Take a look now at verses 10 and 11. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Did you notice in verse 11 that there would come a time when Judah and Israel, the southern and northern kingdoms, would be gathered together under one head? And this is a reference to the coming of Christ and the Messiah. And if you'll look at the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 23, chapter 2, 23, and I will sow unto her. I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. There's coming a time when there will be restoration. You know when that time is? We don't have to wonder. Peter, by inspiration, tells us as he quotes this very passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10, and says, This is the fulfillment of Hosea 2.23. Jesus has come and Jews, Gentiles, Gentiles who were not God's people are now the people of God under Christ. The one head who unites uh, Israel and Judah. All of God's people are together under Christ. And so you can read 1 Peter 2 and verse 10 and you'll see that Peter, by inspiration, quotes Hosea 2, verse 10. So all is not lost. All hope is not lost. Uh, when Gomer uh, leaves her husband, there's coming a time when they would be together again. And in that sense, we might say that God and his people would be together again. But not literally. The people of Israel would go into captivity. But down the road... Spiritually speaking, the Messiah would come and there would be a time of restoration. If you look ahead to chapter 3, you'll read there about Gomer being restored to her husband uh, Hosea. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of, of her friend, yet an adulteress according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. That's a reference to uh, Hosea taking back his wife. The adulteress is Gomer. The friend is Hosea. Go back to your wife. Take her and be restored to her. And they were. And you can read there chapter 3, 1 through 5. But again, we have to emphasize that the people refused to repent and that's chapter 8, and we're not going to take the time to read that uh, because we're running, running out of time here. And then in chapter 9 and verse 3, you'll read where Hosea specifically prophesies about the Assyrian captivity. And, and yet, in spite of all of that, in spite of their rebellion, God would take them back. Turn, turn ahead to chapter 14, verse 4. And notice how the book ends with this, this ray of hope. God saying, I will still have you back. Uh, chapter 14, verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will heal their backsliding. So God would heal the relationship. He would still take them back. It wasn't too late if they would only repent. They did not. 
and they were taken into captivity. Here are some lessons we learned. I know we're just about out of time. We learned the need for knowledge. Chapter 4, verse 6, a passage you're familiar with. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. And so why were God's people destroyed? Lack of knowledge. They had turned away from God. They abandoned his commandments. Even the priest had become corrupt. And for that reason, they would fall. Well, we need knowledge. And we need to continue to acquire more and more knowledge. Another lesson we learn from this book is that God's love is unconditional. We see that in the closing part of the book. In spite of all of the sin that they were guilty of, murder and committing adultery and lying and swearing and worshiping Baal and all of those things, God said, I'll still take you back. I still love you. And the Bible says in Romans 5, verses 8 and 9, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so God's love is unconditional. Uh, salvation is not unconditional. Salvation is conditional. We must meet conditions in order to be saved. But his love is unconditional. Sinners will go to hell unsaved, but they will not go to hell unloved because God loves all and his love is unconditional. We learn that God's patience is limited. That's a lesson we learn. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering. That's right, Second Peter 3 9. But one day his patience will wear thin, and there'll come a time when judgment will fall. And we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Second Corinthians five, verse ten. And that was true of these people as well. And judgment was coming, and it did come. 2 Kings chapter 17, you can read it there and you'll see that judgment came and they were taken into captivity. We also learn from this book that God demands that we be faithful to Him. No other lovers. We might think of it as a love relationship because it is a love relationship. We're to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And God says no other lovers. We can't depend on other things or people as though they were God because God is to be supreme in our lives. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And so we should love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Matthew twenty-two, thirty-seven. 37. And then this lesson, one has never drifted so far from God that he cannot be forgiven. Just think of all of the sins that we have described here, and yet there was still forgiveness offered. There was still mercy. There was still compassion. And the same is true today. No one has drifted beyond the scope of God's grace. God will still forgive, regardless of a sin that one has committed. If one will turn to God and obey the gospel or be restored as a child of God, a wayward child of God, then God will forgive. Uh, the Apostle Paul identified himself as the chief of sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15. So I don't think any of us have ever done anything worse than Saul of Tarsus did in slaughtering Christians, and yet he was forgiven. And all today can be forgiven who will meet the conditions of pardon. Well, these are some lessons we learned from the great book of Hosea. And I hope that maybe uh, you'll go back and read some, some of that book yourself and learn more about this great prophet.